Well, thank you for joining me. I'm so thrilled to talk to you today. And um, the subject is your piano piece, or actually larger project, really. It's more than a piano piece. I only bite because you make me. Tell us a little bit about how you came to this project. Well, I was asked by um, the Theatre Royal Concert Hall in Nottingham uh, to put together a program of music for small screen, as in music for computer games. So I'd performed a solo recital there uh, the year before with a piece I'd commissioned from a composer called Cheryl Francis Hode for um, piano and Commodore 64, an 80s home computer, um, which she'd written the notes for and I'd programmed in and uh, we played alongside. Um, and they'd enjoyed that. And so they said, will you come back and do this music for small screen programme? Because they, the Halle um, were playing an orchestral programme that evening of music for big screen. So they thought it would make quite a nice pre-concert concert. concert. Um, so I put together this programme of some uh, video game music arrangements I planned uh, to make, uh, which I did. Um, I also... Um, shared the programme with another uh, instrumentalist and kind of composer, chip tune composer um, called Blake Troys, who played some, uh, I think it was Sonic game music out of his Game Boy. And uh, I basically uh, put forward this piece of um, a game of Snake that was um, performed along to so they would be synchronized the music and the visuals would be synchronized um and you'd sort of see the cause and effect of the visuals uh you'd hear it in sound so i had this idea right. and uh, there was a composer there is a composer called benjamin oliver who um i work with a lot as a pianist and he loves doing these synchronized kind of pieces so he seemed like a perfect option uh, or perfect choice to write this piece um, but by the time everything all came around there was no time and no funding so I just had to write the piece myself um, and yeah so it's the first sort of uh, grown-up piece I wrote in terms of I used to compose as a teenager but essentially this piece uh, came out of me having backed myself into a corner having declared a program and then having to deliver it so it was your idea um, sort of as music director, not necessarily as the composer of this project. Interesting. Yeah. Now, are you familiar with these video games? Do you play these video games? Or sort of. So I, uh, the Commodore 60 thing came about because that's the computer I grew up with and I still have. It's in the corner of my room. I love it. Um, in terms of... Um, present day gaming I think if I were to call myself a gamer actual gamers would uh, turn their noses up at me but I, okay. I do enjoy it a good video game for sure excellent so th so the idea was already in your mind as you were coming up with the project you just didn't realize you were going to be composed yeah I wanted to find a way to make a program that was game music that was varied still because there is so much mm -hmm. uh, variety within the genre when it comes to that music being represented in the games. I wanted to make sure it didn't come across like a program of a few beeps and boops and the same sort of idea for an hour. So my game arrangements as well, some of them used a uh, prepared piano to get some of the weirder sounds that came out in games. Um, so I really tried to explore the variety of what that world has to offer um, in that piano recital. So yeah, I thought it would be a good way for it not just to be especially if it's for the, um, the Halle audience. Many of them won't know the references. So there may, I, I didn't want there to be less enjoyment coming out of it just because people weren't gamers. So that's where the idea for that piece came from. Well, I, I, and I understand what you're saying, but I think it works so well, no matter what your gaming background is. Um, so because you have this visual that, you're tracking, you know, we all know the idea of writing music for film and it, it's just taking the, the listener's visual perception in a certain way. So 
um, I do think it works no matter whether you're a gamer or not. Can you explain to us a little bit of the process of putting the piece together? Um, it was really hard. Uh, obviously, <laughs> knowing the story of how it came about, the fact that the underlying feeling was, <gasps> uh, is, you know, possibly quite understandable. Um, so what I did was I found um, this gif, actually, of uh, Snake being completed very quickly on the Creative Commons, essentially, and I slowed it down. So I went from there. I just sort of chose a speed. Um, I confess, part of that was knowing how long the piece had to be. Uh -huh. um, so I took that length and that speed. And from there, I, um, I put that into the music program Logic. Okay. Um, and I plotted in just in a really dry way um, where all the bites came. So I just scrolled through the video and I put just uh, a MIDI actually sound on where all of those were. Mm -hmm. I then put those into um, Sibelius, the notation program, mm -hmm. uh, at which point it was obviously a mess of demi semi quavers and ties everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And I humanized it. Uh, I thought about what at that sort of speed I could reasonably expect what I could expect of myself mm -hmm. um, and you know whether having a chord come on the last demi semi quaver of the bar whether I'd be able to do that accurately enough for that to be worth it or so I, I mostly just um, I think I went down to semi quavers okay. uh, and tidied it up a bit um, um, so when we're, when we're following it, it looks like it lines up, but it's maybe just slightly off because like what you're what you're saying is you're humanizing it. You're just you're making it fit yeah. for the normal perception of what the beat is. Yes, and for what any human being behind a piano can do. Right, right. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't have bet money at that speed that I could put that demi semi quaver in the right place and mm -hmm. actually it landing somewhere slightly squarer. I was more confident that I could actually get that exactly right. So there was a lot of backwardsing and forwardsing of these MIDI sounds and seeing if my brain would suddenly go, that one's wrong. That has to go sort of the other side of that margin of error. So I put all of those in. Uh -huh. And so then- you're constantly listening back and forth as to whether it, it works with the, with the video game. Yeah, definitely. So there was a lot of uh, cross-eyedness. Uh, and then I started to put notes to it and I just went for a scale going down. It wasn't particularly, um, it wasn't consciously uh, a string like a snake is. It wasn't, that wasn't a, a picture in my mind at that time, but that was essentially all the material I needed to do to write the whole piece. Um, it's It's all, almost all from stepwise things or relationship to the tonic, I think, um, between that and motor rhythms. Um, so I went, yeah, I, and then I just kept checking back on the screen um, for where, so I work a lot with dancers um, and where I thought something movement, movement wise needed painting. So occasionally where uh, a certain beat lines up with the snake sort of hitting a wall or something like that, I would watch it and I would think, oh, something needs to happen there. And I just started plotting in more and more that way. Um, and basically the further on the piece got, the more I had to take into account that kind of thing and be more and more creative because I found quite, quite quickly that essentially I felt like the structure of the piece visually is quite flawed because actually the distance between all the bites gets further and further apart. And just watching a snake sort of do this, when you know it's gonna end up here eventually, um, keeping that tension was quite hard. So that involved a lot of watching and a lot of gut instinct of, oh, I feel like that's a raising of stakes somehow where it seems to be about to take a wrong turn or something like that. So. Um, Yes, the further away the bites got, the more I had to look at the movement of the snake. And that brings us to um, a question I had is how, 
how you took what seems like such a dry process and turned it into such a dramatic piece. And what you're explaining is that when the snake route became longer, you had to um, decide what to fill it in with. It wasn't just there's a pattern and then there's the next bite because too much time would have gone by. Right. Definitely. So, yeah. Um, and I think it, so it really was a dry process. And then I think almost to my dismay, I found how, how much time was spent not biting uh -huh. uh, and, you know, trying to make these long lines out of things that are far apart and then getting further apart um, became less and less useful. So actually I was getting much more out of going, I feel like at this moment, some kind of vibe change needs to happen and mm -hmm. that's going to be this section and it became very much the other way around of I'm I'm running along with this kind of thing going yeah. and there's a bite here so there's certainly a bit where um all the bites are just a note that doesn't belong to the groove that's going on um and that was yeah that was also quite interesting of uh having to keep an eye on the fact that nothing got more, uh, nothing got too on the outside of the texture that you would have expected a bite there. So right. definitely I would so, sort of suddenly move from an area over here and then do one of these. And on the top note, you'd go, but why was there a top note there? That didn't justify that. So um, I did do a lot of cause and effect and a lot of watching and just gut instinct of, uh, I think I said to you in the past at some point, um, yeah. I was quite a brutal editor of just that gut instinct of going, no, that's wrong. I don't know how yet, but that doesn't feel right. Interesting. And that brings me to my next question is, um, so you're describing the process of putting this together and how your own creative process became a part of it. Um, do, you, do you imagine that the piece can work without tracking the video game? That your piece stands I, yeah I don't know the answer to this um and I'm totally on the fence about it so um I'm quite biased having felt the structure come together and because um I think you're getting the sense of uh, a very new composer having to wrestle with uh something that wasn't an easy challenge for me I'm quite biased in thinking that the structure of the, the, the audio on its own might be flawed, but I actually don't know. I've never tried it on its own. I've never tried it, for example, without a click. I don't know if, um, so I performed it live the first time mm -hmm. and it went down really well. I was really pleased, but it was incredibly stressful because you have an audience that knows when something should have happened. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I dropped a quaver somewhere, they would have known that for the rest of the piece. Um, so there's a part of me that I feel like the reaction I got from them was partly about the human feet involved of mm -hmm. that concentration. Mm -hmm. um, and despite me being sort of quite animated when I speak, I think I must've just been um, when I was performing it. Um, I would love for it to work on its own. That would be so nice if I'd written something strong enough. I, it would just be a nice story of, you know, you're always telling people when they're creating, you know, take a starting point and then run with it. Um, and it would be such a, a nice thing to find that, oh, actually, by being constrained by all these things, you've made something sort of weird and unusual, a structure you never would have chosen for yourself. Uh, and if that worked, that would be amazing, especially those chords at the end. I wonder how you'd perform them if you didn't have the snake holding the tension for you. There's just silence in between them. Uh, which I think it sort of needs at that point because there's been so much sound, but it's, it would be quite a hard thing to hold if people don't know where the end of the piece is. But then the flip side of it, I was given this advice when I was a teenager about writing for dance. Um, that was, and I don't know if it applies to everything, um, but the idea that you write something that has space for the other discipline to inhabit. So, um, you know, if you, if you, the idea was that if I was writing for dance and I wrote something too busy or too attention grabbing, I wasn't leaving enough room for the dance to interpret things in the gaps. I was kind of, I'd be dictating to them what they had to do. Um, 
And so in a sense, I've got this lasting feeling of, oh, well, if it does work without the visuals, then does that mean I haven't left enough room for the visuals? But then I think about all the, the ballet music that's performed on its own and the Rite of Spring or whatever. And I think, well, maybe that's, that doesn't apply all the time. So yeah, that's a very long answer for, I don't know if it works. I haven't tried. But I think we've set up an interesting experiment for our listeners. Inevitably, they will now watch the video and track the game, but also listen to the video without tracking the game. Yeah. I know, I've already shared with you that I, th I think the piece works exceptionally well without the video game. So there's my- Thank you. And I, I have a question for you, if that's allowed in this situation. Um, when you explored, uh, so did, if you played it yourself without the video, did you choose to take more time over bits or did you keep yourself quite rigid? Um, I, I can imagine there being a lot of opportunity for um, taking time. If you don't need the click track to follow along with the video game, then there's a lot, there, there is going to be a lot of interpretation of timing probably. So that, that would need your input as to whether you think that makes the piece fall apart or whether it's allowed or whether. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are definitely some of the groove bits I found quite hard to keep in time because they're almost um, just a couple of them are just a bit too slow almost. So oh, really? they come out kind of angry and grumpy uh, <laughs> but in terms of how those things normally feel in front of a piano. It was just, I think, I mean, my score has got big circles of calm down, <laughs> which <laughs> does not work. Uh, and I was imagining sort of that it would pull apart. But what you're saying is like, it's a, it's, it's almost easier to propel forward. A not... bit of both, I think. Okay. Um, certainly the bigger, the, the more uh, romantic or, or filmic bits, I suppose, I feel like they could pull apart. Uh, but there are certainly some of the driving bits that uh, I feel like if it were a band, for example, they'd naturally just lean forward a little bit, um, which is no good for the, the immovable snake. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm up for people trying whatever they like, to be honest, it should be an alive thing. And I was just thinking, you know, the, given what we're talking about, the piece could, the snake could take on a whole new life of its own. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, and I mean, from that point of view, people uh, could take the video and write their own pieces. Or, um, I mean, there was, there was a moment where I thought, I wonder if this would work as an improvised piece uh, where I just stare at the screen and have to catch it. I uh -huh. wonder how much uh, it, there would be with me not having a timer or anything, but just trying to catch it in that kind of game kind of a way, if that could be right. fun. That sounds interesting. Mm. Sounds like an interesting exercise, an interesting creative game to play with oneself. Yeah, I mean, it could be, uh, I'm now just, we're now just chatting, aren't we? Uh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it could be uh, like an ensemble piece where people take turns and if you miss one you're out like it could be a ridiculous ridiculous game <laughs> I like it <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well thank you for um, joining me and telling us about this project what do you have coming up what's your next wow so coming up um, I've got a couple of nice things. So I'm writing a piece um, for a group called Sound and Music about climate change, which actually, again, is about gaming. I'm collaborating with Blake Troys um, on something called Choose Your Poison, where people are posed essentially overly simplified binary questions about the environment. Uh, like, do you want to use this bit of land to build community buildings or have it as a wildlife reserve uh, and then I've written bits of music for different strands of the environment so the ozone layer or ocean acidity and depending on your answers they will adjust um, they will adapt to what your choices are so you get a kind of sonic version of the consequences of what your choices are. So I've got that coming up. Our deadline is the 24th of May and it'll be re released after then. Um, and piano wise, um, I have uh, 
well, it's it's mostly um, kind of, uh, I don't know about where, what you're doing at the moment, but basically all the creatives I know have sat in lockdown and written stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing a lot of, uh, <laughs> of playing people's uh, uh, newly written stuff, uh, mostly musicals. Actually, it's theatre land that's popped back to life most quickly. Uh, but yes, in the autumn, I'm performing with a saxophonist called uh, Naomi Sullivan, um, and we're doing some concerts that are focused on female composers, uh, past and present, uh, and we are hoping to perform them live and also stream them. So hopefully, as soon as things get pinned down, which you know. We know what the world is now like. <laughs> um, I will put those up on my website. You should be able to find them there. Wonderful. Well, I look forward. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ishani.